Welcome to the Occult London podcast. This is a new podcast dedicated to exploring magic, mysticism, the Kabbalah, as well as other topics of interest. This is the fourth episode of a series exploring different concepts in relation to the Kabbalistic tree of life. I'm your host, Will, and I'll be guiding you on this journey through the mysteries. Um, I'm not an expert, but rather a student like you, and this is a project for me to learn as well as hopefully share some ideas with you guys. Um, If you like the podcast, then please um, visit our website. The address is in the show notes. Um, In this episode, we will be looking at the second sephira of the Tree of Life, which is known as Chokhmah. This is the sphere directly uh, proceeding from um, Keta, which is what we discussed in the previous episode. The title of the Sephira is Chokhmah, which means wisdom. The name of God is Yah. Uh, the archangel is Ratziel, which means secret of God. The angelic host is the Elfanim, or wheels. And the astrological correspondences are Masloth, or the zodiac. The tarot correspondences are the four twos and the four kings of the pack. And the elemental correspondence is fire. The path text... Um, for this particular sephira goes as follows. The second path is called the illuminating intelligence. It is the crown of creation, the splendor of the unity equaling it. It is exalted above every head and named by Kabbalists the second glory. The magical image is an old man with a long white beard wearing a long plain grey robe and holding a rough wooden staff. He is facing the viewer's left and looking slightly upwards. Um, additional symbols for this particular sephira are, you know, phallic symbols, um, and the additional titles would be Abba or the Supernal Father. The colours that correspond with the four worlds that we discussed in the introduction are for Atzaluth would be pure soft blue, for Bria would be grey, for Yetzira would be iridescent pearl grey, and for Zaya would be white flicked with red, blue, and yellow. The correspondence in the microcosm would be the chia, or spiritual will, and the correspondence in the body is the left side of the head. The grade of initiation is 9 equals 2, or the magus, and those are the main correspondences that we'll be talking about. So in terms of this sephira, um, chokhmah means wisdom, and the Hebrew spelling is cheth, kaf, and mem, and hey. And it sits at the top of the pillar of mercy opposite Bina and is the masculine creative energy from above and represents the first movement or energy down the tree. So it can be described as being the positive force from which all of creation is born. One of the symbols of Hokma is the erect phallus, which gives us the idea of Hokma as being the supernal father and the basis of spiritual will exploding into the space of Bina, where the beginnings of form are to be found. And here you can also see the beginnings of duality in its relationship with Bina. These two sephira of the supernal triad are the powerhouse of the tree of life. And it has also been described as the two-stroke engine, generating force and form down into manifestation. This is explained well by Dion Fortune when she says, In Bina and Hokma we have the archetypal positive and negative, the primordial maleness and femaleness, established while countenance beheld not countenance and manifestation was incipient. It is from these primary pairs of opposites that the pillars of the universe spring, between which is woven the web of manifestation. And also Chick Shisero describes this well when he says the following, As the first sephira to develop polarity, Hochma is placed at the summit of the pillar of mercy, or the right-hand pillar. If Keta can be described as a point, then Hokma would be dis- portrayed as a straight line and an extension of the point into space. The energy of chromes is dynamic and outpouring, for it is the great stimulator of the universe. Within Hokma likes the first masculine, fire, expression as opposed to the androgynous expression of Keta. Whereas Keta is the calm centre of the universe, Hokma is complete action and moving, the vital element of element of existence. It is the archetypal positive and the great supernal father, Abba. 
However, Hockmer is not simply a masculine sexual energy, but rather the root essence of masculine or dynamic force. So the archetypal masculine lies within this sephira, and obviously the archetypal feminine lies within Bina, and this is the basis of polarity. And um, one of the things that you find with creation is that you need masculine and feminine forces to enable manifestation. The masculine is the positive energy, and the feminine is the negative the forces of Hockham are born into restriction in Bina, and thus this transference of energy is essentially almost like a small death into matter. Um, Dion Fortune also talks about this when she says the following from the, the mystical Kabbalah. When it is realised that the dynamic male type of force is the stimulator of upbuilding and evolution, and that the female type of force is the builder of forms, it will be seen that the nomenclature is apt for form. Although it is the builder and organiser, it is also the limiter. Each form that is built must in turn be outgrown, lose its usefulness and so become a hindrance to evolving life, and therefore the bringer in of disillusion and decay, which leads on to death. The father is the giver of life, but the mother is the giver of death, because her womb is the gate of ingress to matter, and through her life is ensouled in form, and no form can be either infinite or eternal. Death is implicit in birth. The right of Hokmah, if such it can be called, is concerned with the influx of cosmic energy. It is formless, the being the pure impulse of dynamic creation, and being formless, the creation it gives rise to can assume any and every form. Hence the possibility of sublimating creative force from its purely priapic aspect. The spiritual of experience of Hokmah is the vision of God face to face and this is sometimes described as being an experience that you cannot really survive um, but what it's really talking about is a union with the the deepest part of ourselves or the highest power in our being as um, one of the phrases from the Corinthians goes for now we shall see through a glass darkly but then face to face now I know in part but then I shall even know even as also I am known so in today's society, we often find we, you know, we don't get the chance to actually sort of sit with ourselves, and every day is a constant struggle. Um, and you know, this is really getting away from that and going to that deepest, deepest part of ourselves, away from all of those distractions. In terms of the planetary forces of the of the Sephira, um, as we've seen from other other ones, and we'll be discussing them in the future, each is just attributed to different planets. Um, However, when we reach Hokmer, there isn't actually a planetary attribution related to it. So it has the attribute of the zodiac or the abode as the fixed stars, which is known as Masloth. So what does this mean to us? Well, so as we can see, so as we've been climbing the tree of life from Earth up through the seven spheres, um, before we reach Keta, we are um, we, we're really in, a, in a, a state beyond all the spheres of the planets and beyond anything we can imagine. And um, this is why it's attributed to the fixed stars, as these are the stars of the zodiacal constellations that are massive distances from Earth and, uh, and, and represent a, a move away from the dualistic nature of the universe through to the universal sphere of influence. So a move away from the three worlds of the causal plane and and what the kind of universe is created from um this concept of the the zodiac also connects up with the the vision of the god face to face that sits within the sphere so as we've seen um from part of the experience of bina is the the vision of sorrow where we experience the death of everything we've known in order to see the unity of things um as we've seen there's there needs to be death in order to experience oneness so likewise, when we're going into the zodiac or the fixed stars, um, we're leaving everything behind that we've known about ourselves in this incarnation. And um, we can actually think about this in terms of um, our actual difference, the 12 signs of the zodiac and how they affect us. So this is actually kind of working on us at a, at a really higher level and looking at the kind of stellar influences behind the actual makeup of our very being and um although we're born and you know live our lives and die upon this earth there's there is also a lot of physics which suggests that you know the universe that we know it's not all created 
by the sun but from the stars themselves so although i'm not a physicist we we do know from science that our bodies are made up of carbon nitrogen oxygen and also other elements that were created in stars for over 4.5 billion years ago and because of these elements can comprise humans animals and the majority of other matter in the earth we can say that we're made of stars so carbon nitrogen and oxygen atoms in our body as well as other heavy elements were created ancient generations ago and because most of the matter on this earth then we are yeah literally made up of of the stars from that point of view this is quite well described by um, Neil deGrasse Tyson when he when he says this the atoms of our body are traceable to stars that are manufactured them in their cores and exploded these enriched ingredients across our galaxy billions of years ago for this reason, we are biologically connected to every other living being in the world. We are chemically connected to all molecules on Earth, and we are automatically connected to all atoms in the universe. We are not figuratively, but literally, stardust. So taking that as an example, one of the good ways of thinking about Hokmer and meditating would be to sit outside on a summer's night, look at the stars, and you know, really sort of focus on that distance and feel the parts of you that belong to that starry realm um moving on to the archangel of the sphere this is ratziel who um according to legend is the archangel who taught adam the kabbalah in paradise um the sephir ratziel hamalach is attributed to this angel and is considered to be a, a book about magic and um ratziel is actually meant to stand by the throne of god Keter and hears and writes everything down um, according to legend, he's meant to given, be given the book to Adam and Eve after they ate the fruit from the tree of knowledge so that they could find their way back home to the divine. And as the legend goes, the other angels were, were pretty upset about this and so they took the book from Adam and threw it into the ocean. Um, God decided then not to punish Ratziel and gave it back to Adam and Eve. And according to other sources, the book then passed on to Enoch, Enoch sorry, and finally to Noah via the ark angel Raphael. The angelic realms of this sphere are the Orphanim, so they are the angels in which the Hebrew means spheres or wheels and this can also refer to the wheels seen in the envision of Ezekiel of the chariot as they also meant to be the angels that never sleep and guard the throne of God. The mythological correspondences, so we can look at obviously all of the father gods that can be attributed here, um, both good and bad for this Sephira. Um, and so it could obviously be the you know the gentle parent but also the kind of ogre aspect of the father. Um, within Arthurian red legend, which is something I'm quite interested in, you could look at figures like Joseph of Arimathea um, as being the figure who carries the grail, um, Sophia wisdom and who buries it at Glastonbury. Um, more darker aspects would be things like Kronos who eats his children um, and other ones would be Odin, Zeus, and Pan. Um, you could also correspond some of the uh, more feminine aspects to this sphere as well in, in the, the aspects of the Pallas Athena, who is a virgin goddess who sprang from the brow of Zeus, and obviously always also Isis Urania, who is the goddess of wisdom. <clears throat> um, in terms of the actual um hebrew letter that's attributed to this sephira so the first letter of the tetragrammaton is attributed to it which is yo and the magical grade of magus um crowley had an interesting point to say on this when he said the grade of magus is traditionally connected with the idea of the number two male creative energy wisdom and the expression of a single idea in terms of duality it transmits the idea of the divine unity to its feminine counterpart, the understanding, somewhat as a man transmits the essence of his racial character to his wife, so that he perceives his innermost nature, itself unintelligible to him by directly, by observing the flowering of that essence in his son. The Hebrew title of the idea embodying these characteristics is Hokma, whose numerical value is 73. And that's from his Confessions. One of the key aspects of this sephir is the idea of the male transmitting the essence of his character, which is unintelligible, 
And uh, this obviously also fits with the idea of um, Hokma as being the inner robe of glory, where the illuminating spirit implants the light of creation into the oceans of Bina. And um, Dion Fortune, who I'm a big fan of, also talks about this when she says, it is the male force that implants the fecundating spark in the passive ovum on all planes and transforms its inert latency into the active upbuilding of growth and evolution. It is the dynamic force of life, which is spirit, that ensouls the clay of physical form and constitutes the robe of glory, that is worn by all things, in whom is the breath of life, force embodied in form, and form ensouled by force, is signified by the illuminating intelligence and the inner robe of glory. As this is the sphere of the Father and the basis of energy, it's, um, you know, as I said, it's associated with any kind of patriarchal figures or sort of patriarchal institutions. So in this sense, you know, things that you could actually think about in relation to this would be things like the government or the country or any kind of ruling force um, in one's life. And that's a, a really good way of uh, working with this particular energy. Um, so that kind of concludes our... Um, talk about Hokma. hope you found it really interesting next week we will be discussing uh, the sphere of Bina uh, which is the archetypal feminine um, thank you very much for joining us on the Occult London podcast I hope you've enjoyed it um, as I said please visit our website um, where you can subscribe to the show and um, we'll catch you soon thank you <laughs>